Thank you, Henrik. Fantastic. Keep that passage open, 1,108, Ephesians chapter 1. It's great to see you all this morning. That is an amazing prayer, isn't it? And uh, before we kind of look at it, we're actually going to just pray it together because it's a prayer that we want to experience uh, this morning. So pray with me before we open God's word together. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray this morning that you will give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we might know you better. Not information about you, data from a distance, but intimate knowledge of you as we meet with you this morning through your word, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're in the second half of this series, On Your Knees, the Prayers of St. Paul. I don't know about you, but whenever I uh, read the prayers of St. Paul, they they kind of blow me away. And this one is probably my favorite of all. Uh, And uh, there's a lot going on in this prayer, isn't there? And the aim of this series is really to ask ourselves as we pray, do our prayers look anything like the prayers of St. Paul? How do you, when you pray, what do you pray for? Do you pray for these things that Paul prays for? And should we be praying these things that Paul prays for? What happens, what might happen if we do? Now, I don't know about you, but I find that regularly there are two temptations in my life as a follower of Jesus, in my life as a Christian. There is uh, frustration on the one hand. I feel that things have slowed down just a little bit. I have got a bit stale, a bit stuck. I feel like I'm treading water and there's something I'd love to see changed in my character and personality. In fact, there's something I know my wife would love to see changed in that as well. And yet, I can't seem to do it. Nothing has happened. I've got stuck somewhere. And the cry of my heart is, is this it? There must be more than this. Have you cried that prayer out to God? Or perhaps you're in that place where I occasionally find myself of of just satisfaction. It's not frustration, it's satisfaction. You feel content. You know that God is good. And things are going well with your life and you've got a disciplined life. You're praying on a regular basis, you read your Bible on a regular basis and you think to yourself... This will do. This is enough. And complacency just begins to set in. And you don't say, is this it? You say, this is it. But I I want to say to you this morning, if you're in that place, that there is even more than that. You see, and the Ephesians are in that place. The Ephesians, says Paul, they're doing well. Look at verse 15. Paul has heard about their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love for all God's people. They have this reputation as a faithful, loving community. And of course, Paul gives thanks for that. That's not a bad thing. That's a fantastic thing. He's not frustrated with them at all, but he wants more for them. He's not content. He's not satisfied. He refuses, doesn't he, do you notice, to be complacent. He wants them to know God more. And he says to them in this letter, and he prays for them in this prayer, there is more, but you have got to ask for it. And that's exactly what he does here. And what we're going to do, we're just going to work through this uh, prayer clause by clause. It is a little dense, but it is beautiful. And I hope as we unpack it, you'll see it's worth just spending our time seeing how Paul prays. And just so you have a sense of where we're going, we're going to begin with this idea that to know God more, you need more of God. 
And then that means that more of God means more hope, more of God means more value, and more of God means more power. So let's begin with this idea that to know God more, you need more of God. Look at verse 17. I keep asking, it's the prayer we just prayed, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. Paul prays for these Ephesian Christians, he would be praying for us if he was here, that we might know God better. Now this is obvious perhaps, but prayer starts with God. It doesn't start with you, it starts with God. When you pray, you've got to know who you're praying to. We need to know who God is. And so Paul says to us, look, this is the God you're praying to. This is the God I pray to. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course it is Jesus who tells us what God is like. Jesus tells us, and we were singing about it earlier, that God is gracious. He loves us. He made us for a relationship with him and he pursues that relationship despite our rejection of him, despite our decision to turn away from him and walk in our own way and do our own thing and live life as if God did not exist. But he doesn't just pursue us, he saves us, he calls us to himself. The Christian faith is is not a religion, a set of rules and rituals of things that we do. It is a rescue as God comes to us in the person of Jesus Christ and dies in our place so that we might be forgiven and set free from those things that we have done wrong, those things that addict and enslave us. So Jesus tells us what God is like. We pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and we pray to the glorious Father Because God is not just gracious, God is glorious. And glory and power here are for Paul synonymous. This is the awesome, magnificent, glorious, mighty, majestic, omnipotent God that Paul is praying to. His God is all powerful. He stands over everything. Everything that exists, exists because God enables it to exist. And so for Paul, prayer is all about this God. Who he is, what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do. And so what he says is to know God more, you need more of this God. Because we don't, as human beings, kind of explore life together and and try and wrestle with what's going on and, and what our part is in this world and where we fit. And we don't, in our own effort and energy, kind of reach up and discover God for ourselves. No. We're dead in our sins. We're blinded by our rebellion. So we can't reach up and out to God. We can't discover him in our own power. Instead, God has to disclose himself to us. It's about revelation. God reveals himself. He introduces himself to us. And we can't see him without him doing that. And so Paul prays that the Spirit might give us this wisdom, this revelation, so that we can see him. He prays that the eyes of our heart might be enlightened so we might have spiritual sight, so we can see God for who he really is. And of course, this isn't isn't knowledge about God, information that we can understand. It is the knowledge of God himself. It is relationship. It is encounter. That is what Paul is praying for here. So if you want to know more of God, or if you want to know God more, rather, you need more of God. And to receive more of God, you have to ask. So do you want to know God more? That's the question 
I want to leave you with this morning. Do you want to know God more? Deep down in your soul, in your heart, do you want to know God more? You are allowed to nod if you like. Do you want to know God more? If you do, you need more of God. And if you want more of God, you need to ask for more of God. And when we ask for more of God, that makes all the difference in the world. And Paul prays for those things that will happen if we know God more. And there are three things. More of God means more hope. More of God means more value. And more of God means more power. Let's look at those in turn. The first one, more of God means more hope. Look at verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The hope to which he has called you. Do you notice it's not your calling? It's his calling. He has called you to this hope. You see, God, for Paul, is not our life coach. He's not the one who helps us in our pursuit of our destiny, in the fulfillment of our dreams and desires. And maybe you're sitting here this morning and you have hopes for a new family or a new house or you are hoping for a new job, a new car. Or you're looking forward to that retirement and a new life, maybe. That's not what Paul is is talking about here when he speaks of hope. This is not, you see, therapy. And the Christian faith has never been therapy. It's not about emotional or psychological or spiritual therapy. It is not here about our needs, our dreams, our hopes. This is all about God's purpose for our lives and the hope that it brings us because we are caught up into his calling Paul is praying here and read Ephesians if you haven't read it it's probably my favorite book I'll confess to you the the scope and the scale of what Paul is talking about in chapter one blows your mind and he places each one of us right in the middle of this cosmic picture from the beginning of time to the end of time to what God is doing right now. We have been involved in all of it because of his grace, because of his great plan of salvation. We are caught up into his big picture. It's the biggest picture of all. A picture of a wounded people, of a a broken world, of a fractured and ruptured cosmos even. And in it, God is doing something new. That's the picture Paul is painting. And in it, he places us as a, a person, part of the people of God saved of a community transformed, of nations that are being changed, of a universe being restored. That gives us hope when we have eyes to see it. Because each of us has a part to play in that great drama of God's rescue plan. That is the source of of our hope. So I ask you this morning, do you need a new purpose? Perhaps for you, life has become just a little mundane and ordinary. Maybe you've lost sight of the big picture. Maybe you've never really known it yourself and your faith has been about God helping you in your life, in the busyness of it all and the the details of life are crowding in and you can't see the wood for the trees. And you find yourself driven, prioritizing those things that don't really matter. And you know that. If that's you, if you need a new purpose, ask. Ask for more of God. Because more of God means more hope. 
Secondly, more of God means more value. Look at verse 18, the second half of it. Paul says, and I'm going to skip a bit here, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know, secondly, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Now, do you notice something here as well? Do you notice it's not your inheritance? It's his This perplexed me, I have to say. I took ages thinking, what on earth is Paul going on about in this verse? Would it not read much better if he said, I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the riches of your glorious inheritance? Because then we'd think, well, he's talking about heaven, wouldn't we? But it's his glorious inheritance in his holy people, in the saints, you and me, in the church, the community of God. So here Paul is not talking about heaven. When he says riches, it's not heaven. God is not our ticket to heaven. As far as Paul is concerned, this is not talking about life after death as some sort of escape or evacuation from this planet. Somehow here, Paul is talking about the church, the people of God, you and me. And he is saying, we, you and I, we are his inheritance, his glorious inheritance, his riches. Think about that for a moment. He is saying, you are the most precious thing that God possesses. Not just us as St. Paul's Shadwell, not just us as church with a big capital C, but you as a follower of Jesus. You are truly appreciated by God. You are beloved. You are prized by God. He values you more than anything else. You see, God has made us his That's who we are. We are his treasured possession. We are his people, his treasure, his riches. You and I, we matter to him. He values us. So I ask you this morning, maybe you're in this place where you need to know how valued you are. Maybe you wrestle with self-worth, self-esteem, Self-belief. Maybe you're here this morning worried about what others really think of you. Maybe you feel unappreciated or inadequate or you're struggling with jealousy because you look at the success of others. And maybe you just feel ashamed and guilty because you keep letting others down, you keep letting yourself down, you keep feeling like you're letting God down. If that's where you are this morning, ask. Ask for more of God. Because more of God means more value. Thirdly, more of God means more power. More power. Look at verses uh, 19. So again, you know, starting off Paul's basic prayer, I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know, thirdly, his incomparably great power for us who believe. Don't know how you pronounce that word exactly. I think British people tend to pronounce incomparably. Europeans and Americans, incomparably. We have to pronounce it that way if we sing that song incomparable because otherwise it doesn't really work. Um, So his incomparably great power for us who believe. Paul here wants us to know there is nothing else like this power. Do you know how he does it? Do you see? He is emphatic, isn't he? He he says the same thing again and again and again. He drives the point home like a pneumatic drill until it is drilled right into the depths of our brains and our hearts. He says God's power is incomparably great. It is exceedingly great. It is mighty strength. There is nothing like it. And having kind of repeated that again and again, he then expands his theme and he really goes to town, doesn't he? He says, says, this power is, is more and more incredible. So this power is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. That's power that has been 
decisively demonstrated. We have seen it at work. We know what God can do. But then Paul says, but he hasn't just raised Jesus from the dead. He's then seated him at the right hand of the Father. And that sense of seating is he's defeated all his enemies. The job has been done. It's mission accomplished. It's his enthronement where his enemies are made the footstool at his feet and he's at the right hand of God, that place of honour and victory, of intimacy and favour. So he's raised him from the dead. He has seated him at the right hand of the Father. But this power that seated him at the right hand of the Father is far above all other powers, he says. Social powers, the cultural forces that we swim in, Economic powers, the power of the market. Political powers, the powers of nation states and governments. He says this power, he goes even further, that seated him at God's right hand, far above all spiritual powers, either in this age or even in the age to come. So he's not just talking about social, economic and political powers, he's talking about spiritual powers too. Spiritual forces at work in the universe, angels, demons, Satan himself, every conceivable power is as nothing in compared to the power of God. Do you believe that? You need to persuade me more than that. (laughs) This is the power of King Jesus. He is the Lord of all. So I wonder this morning, if you're sitting there, do you think, I feel stuck? I'm in that place of frustration, actually, Rod. And I need power to change. I need new life. Actually, perhaps you're sitting there and you're not a follower of Jesus and you have no idea uh, what I'm talking about. You have not experienced the knowledge of God. You have not experienced the power of his resurrection life and you need new life. You need that vitality. Perhaps you need confidence to live out the Christian life, to be obedient, to say no to sin and Satan. Perhaps you feel trapped and addicted by that sin, and you find yourself just repeating habits again and again and again that you can't escape from. Or perhaps you're here this morning and you feel oppressed by evil spiritual forces, and you want help. This is what Peter O'Brien, an Australian commentator, says about these verses. The resources in Christ available to believers who live in the overlap of the ages are enormous. We, you and I, we live in the overlap of the ages. Listen to that again. The resources in Christ available to believers who live in the overlap of the ages are enormous. Do you need to change? Do you need that freedom that you crave? Ask. Ask for more of God. Because more of God means more power. So in a moment, we're going to do some of this stuff. Because I don't want you just to be sitting there listening and thinking about it and thinking to yourself, this is good theory. We're going to do some praying. Is that okay? Cool. But just to refresh your memory of where we have been. I've said that to know God more, you need more of God. The good news is, all you have to do is ask. That's your job. That's my job. That's what we need to do. All you have to do is ask. And you might want to pray for hope. And so, I'll encourage you. Ask for more of God. Because more of God means more hope. Do you need that new purpose, God's purpose, that big picture the right perspective that you've lost sight of. Ask for more of God. 
Because more of God means more hope. Or perhaps you need a new identity or to be reminded of who you really are, how much God values you, how much he treasures you. Then what I want you to do is pray for more of God. Because more of God means more value. Or maybe you are here this morning and you've never put your trust and faith in what Jesus has done for you. Or maybe you are uh, aware that you, you do believe, but your life has never been changed. No one would really know any different. They wouldn't know that you were a Christian unless you said, I go to church. Maybe you have been wrestling and battling Satan and you find yourself defeated and you feel powerless. Well, I'd encourage you to pray this morning for more of God. Because more of God means more power. You see, what I believe passionately is that there is more available for every one of us today. This morning, here and now in this place, do you believe that? And do you want it? Do you want more? Well, all you have to do is ask. And that's what we're going to do right now. So can I ask you to stand?